This is a reference video where we are talking about um, the four rational spirits and specifically uh, unclean spirits, which are fallen angels. And this is a reference video because we're asking the question, do Christians have a sin nature? And that is an important question because it directly reflects upon the enmity in which we find ourselves and it, it, it kind of, it, it, it shifts the balance of it. And so it's really important for us to understand, do we have corruption in our hearts or not? Because that's going to influence a huge way of how we respond to things and even how we, how we uh, understand theology. Um, there is a, a church out of Redding, California, sort of the mecca of um, charismatic circles and I'm not here to attack charismatic circles. It's where I cut my teeth. Um, I believe the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I believe that he does exactly the same things today that he did in the book of Acts. Um, unfortunately, God finds himself in a church that doesn't seem to believe that very much, which is one reason why we don't, we don't see it. Um, but this Bethel church, they, they actually teach that Christians do not have a sin nature, and uh, Chris, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Valatin or Valaton, um, he actually teaches that Christians do not have a sin nature and he calls it a doctrine of devils um, because I guess P Christians think badly about themselves or something because they're uh, feeling like they're in bondage to sin when in fact they're not. And so um, let's start by reading some of the scriptures and they are they are very bold scriptures to tr try and understand how, um, I'm just going to call him Mr. Chris, and that Bethel and company have come to this conclusion. Um, so uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 2 Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are new. Uh, the Romans chapter 6, uh, verses uh, 6 and on. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he that died died unto sin once, but he that liveth liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but be alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let sin therefore reign let not therefore let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Uh, Colossians three three for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ. Uh, Colossians two ten and you are complete in Him which is the head of all principality, in power. Uh, verse eleven in whom ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcising of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, where uh, in ye also you are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead. And then verse 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you your trespasses. And um, Ephesians 5, 8 through 9, For you were once darkness, but are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Uh, Galatians 5.24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So on and so forth. And so I'm going to link in the description this, this document that I'm reading from with all of these scriptures. But, you know, new creature. And th the implication is, it is done. Why can't you understand that? It is done. Wake up. Right? Something like that. Well, man, that, that sounds convincing, Whenever, whenever you read all of those scriptures and you're like, like crap, like there isn't any more sin, like I'm a new creature, like I'm crucified with Christ, like 
the old has passed away, the new has come. Like, I am I am new. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. But the, the problem and one of the huge problems that we find ourselves in with respect to the interpretation of Scripture is that we just kind of cherry pick the verses that sound similar to each other. They seem to reinforce each other. But we ignore the fact that there's 33,000 verses and not just, I mean, I don't know how many verses I read, fewer than 10. There's, there's 33,000 verses and not just 10 verses. And so if you just read the 10 verses or whatever, 20 verses, and you're like, you know, heck, like, well, this is how it is. Except that there's 33,000 other verses. What do they say? Do they shed light on what we're talking about? And let me tell you something. Yes, from the start with this book on the Holy Spirit, in order to, to understand who he is, we need to access the full revelation of God's word and not just the New Testament, not just the, the parts that we're familiar with. Um, okay, so the, herein lies the, the flaw, okay? The Bible, the authors of the New Testament, the doctrine of the apostles, they speak of salvation in, in three different modes. And to some degree, I have to admit that it's a mystery because it's kind of hard for us to, to understand this. Have been saved, as in, it is done, period. Are being saved, as in, in progress. And will be saved, as in, eh, hasn't happened yet. And so it's like, how do you, how do you jive for example, the two, which kind of seem like a contradiction, have been saved, will been saved, will be saved, i.e. hasn't happened yet. This sort of a paradox of already not yet, but even using the term already not yet misses that there are three modes. I mean, the, the not yet would be our being in progress and then also will be. Um, the kingdom of God is referred to in exactly the same way. Um, the first words that Jesus said in his public ministry, repent, the kingdom of God is near. Right? The kingdom is within you. But then he also says things like it gives, you know, your father great pleasure to give you the kingdom. Um, the the uh, disciples asked Jesus, when, when, when will you consummate Israel? Like, when is it going to happen? Like, even they recognized that though there was something going on, the fullness of it obviously hadn't been done yet. Just a very, a very simple way to know that the whole thing hasn't been done yet is Paul writes to the Corinthians that we're going to have a spiritual body. And so then you ask yourself the question, I mean, so you die, you die a physical death, then um, you're raised from the dead and God gives you a spiritual body and that body, and we, we see a little bit of a clue in how Jesus, you know, he, he just like appears in a room, the doors locked, don't seem to stop him, something like that. Yet he can still eat food. Uh, he still has the, the scars in his hands. Um, do you have that spiritual body yet? Because if you don't have that spiritual body yet, and again, Paul had had this criticism for the, the Corinthians, like you're reigning without us in the kingdom. Like, I wish I wish that you were reigning in the kingdom because we'd be reigning along with you. Like you, you think that you are just kings and queens and every tongue will confess and every knee will bow you to you. And I, I mean, of course, that's heresy. Right. But like, I wish that you were reigning. I wish that the, the, the kids at Bethel. Um, were reigning because it would mean that we were reigning with them. They're not any better than us or any more spiritual than us, right? They, they're not sealed with a different Holy Spirit than we're sealed with. So, um, so let's read some scriptures uh, that indicate to us that this is a work in progress and it hasn't already been done yet. Uh, Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, of course, the question is, well, have you been saved, 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 more than anyone's ever been saved or will ever be saved? It's just done, 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 done. Why, why do you have to take up your cross? But it's done. Jesus, Jesus, bro, 
Jesus. You don't understand. It's done. It's more done than anything's ever been done and will ever be done. It's done, bro. Well, Jesus said, no. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Okay, Matthew 26, 40 through 41. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? If you do not watch with me one hour, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Bro, Jesus, we're in the new age. The old has passed away. The new has come. I'm newer than new, bro. I mean, you're supposed to be the king. Don't you know that I'm newer than new? I'm the newest thing that's ever existed, will ever exist. I'm just utterly new. Don't you know that? Right, I'm, I'm being absurd. Um, Romans twelve two, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, Romans thirteen twelve through fourteen, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. I mean, if you don't have any works of darkness, how are you going to cast it off? It's kind of like. It's kind of like Paul saying, don't go to Mars. And you can go anywhere around the earth. You can even go in the orbit of the earth. But don't you go to Mars. Don't you do it. Because you'll be a wicked, filthy, wicked sinner if you go to Mars. They can't do it. If he's telling them to do something that they can't do. They don't have the works of darkness because they're not infected with sin anymore. So goes the claim. And so him saying, don't go to Mars... How are they going to go to Mars? Are they going to build a rocket ship 2,000 years ago and go to Mars and then die? Probably on the way there. I mean, they wouldn't even get out of orbit. I mean, Paul is telling them to do something because they can actually do it, right? He's not telling them to do something that they can't remotely, remotely, remotely possibly do in 10,000 times 10,000 years, right? Um Okay, so, and then specifically, uh, Romans 13, 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. If you don't have the flesh, then how, how could you make provisions thereof? Don't you make provisions to go to Mars? Don't you do it. Don't you do it. Because you'll be a filthy, wicked sinner. Don't you do it. They can't make provisions to go to Mars. It's not possible. Save the spirit of the Lord, whisk them away, which he doesn't seem uh, very willing to do, right? He's not telling them to do something that they can't remotely, remotely, remotely obey. He's telling them to do something that they should obey, which is to not make provision for a part of them, which is their old man. And just just uh, thinking along the lines of my understanding of exactly what the flesh means the old man, the sin nature, the unregenerated sin nature. That is the unrenewed mind, the unrenewed spirit of God. Remember in Ezekiel 36, he's, God says that he's going to give me a new spirit. Well, it's that old spirit. And it's sometimes it's hard to make a distinction between the old and the new because we just want to say, up, oh, old, up, oh, new. But, it, right, it's in progress, right? And so God is... is transforming from the old to the new. That's what he's doing. And so we're renewing our mind. We're, there's a video on that. Changing the way that we think about things. Changing the way that we respond to things. God promises in uh, Psalm chapter 23 that he's the restorer of our soul. And so if you think about you've lived your entire life until the moment you're sealed with the Holy Spirit under the dominion of Satan fulfilling the lust of the flesh and of the mind, and all of that junk is being kind of collected in your soul, which is your person, your identity, right? Your memories. And then all of a sudden you have the Holy Spirit, but all that stuff in the soul, it's not presto, change, oh, gone. It's still there. And your patterns and modes of thinking are still there. And so it has to be changed. The idea that it's just done, wake up, get over it, clue in. Well, no, it has apparently pleased the Lord that we're not just resurrected in the blink of an eye right now, but it's pleased the Lord that we have to struggle through. Some things, whenever God seals us with the Holy Spirit, are whisked away, never to be heard from again. And it may be sexual immorality, drug addiction, anger, things like that. 
And then there may be some other things that God just leaves that we have to struggle with our whole lives, right? And this is just the experience of day-to-day life. This is not some fanciful theory. <sighs> okay, so 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 1-4. through 4, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual... But as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hereto you were not able to bear it. How can someone who's newer than new and who's just utterly a new creation in Christ and it is done, 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 why does Paul have to speak to them as babes? Right? For ye are yet carnal, whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? For one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? I mean, if if you're newer than new, then how are you carnal, right? Um, So 1 Corinthians 10, 6. Now these things were examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as was written, the people sat down and drank and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of certain. And so Paul's saying, don't tempt Christ. But if, if your heart is just utterly, utterly new and it is done, 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 according to this claim, how are you going to tempt Christ? And then how, how is it that Paul is telling you don't do something that you can't do in ten trillion, 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 trillion years. I mean, actually, for eternity, um, forevermore, because you're utterly sealed in Christ, because you have that heart that that utterly loves God and only wants Him and only follows Him and only obeys Him. How in the world are you going to tempt Christ? How is Paul telling you to do something that's not remotely within the universe realm of possibility for you to do? He's telling you not to do it because it is possible. That's why he's saying it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, uh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And how, how do you have filthiness of flesh and spirit if you're just new, 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 and just, just utterly just the most newest creation that anyone's ever heard of? And so this is the part of the challenge in interpreting Scripture, is instead of just taking one verse and saying it's true, is it true? Yes. But are the all the other Scriptures true equally? They're simultaneously true. And so what do we have to do? We have to hold them in balance. We have to hold them in temp- tension. The, the task of the in- person who is interpreting scripture has to take all scripture which is equally true and we have to put it together in a model of sorts and as though putting a puzzle together and see how it all fits and the problem is somebody who just relies upon one little scripture says, oh it's in scripture it's true you can never say anything ever again well, yeah but the other thirty-three thousand verses are also true and so if you just take one verse to the neglect of all the other verses, you're going to miss out on the right and true interpretation. You're not going to rightly divide Scripture, and therefore you're ultimately going to come to error because God has revealed the whole Bible and not just the one little verse that you've picked. And so now let's go. I mean, again, you can read. There's dozens of Scriptures here. You can read, will be transformed. Uh, this is from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 4 through 9. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, shall they shall inherit the earth. Have we inherited the earth? <laughs> what is called in the West Post Christianity, have we inherited the earth? Come on. Right? They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which are hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So that, I mean... Right, the people at Bethel who say that they're utterly, utterly, utterly new, well, apparently they've seen God because the Bible says you shall see God. So apparently it's just done, right? According to this little philosophy. Um, uh, Luke thirteen twenty nine, and they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Apparently this has happened already. And we just, I guess... We got left out. <laughs> we didn't get the notice. Um, 
Romans 6, 5, for we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. We shall also be the likeness of his resurrection. Apparently, we're already in the likeness of his resurrection, right? Um, Galatians 5, 5, for we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Something along the lines of either in progress or it just hasn't happened yet, right? And so we have to... Um, uh, Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, hadn't happened yet, second coming hadn't happened yet, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Uh, Titus 2, 13 through 14, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all inequity and purity unto himself, a peculiar people zealous of good works. Um, 1 Peter 4.13, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, future tense, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And so I'm going to have to make a second part of this because the video is running long already. The point is, is that there are three modes of salvation have been saved, which is firmly where the Bethel camp is rooted. Unfortunately, they've neglected two out of the three modes, which is our being saved. And that's utterly consistent with our, tra our, our experience every second of every moment of every hour of every day. The experience of every person who's ever lived is that they're in progress. They're on a journey. They haven't gotten there yet, right? And then will be saved. And this is the great hope and promise of the gospel, it's coming. There's coming a day when every tongue confess, every knee will bow, every tear will be wiped from our eye. We will be given a new spiritual body. We'll be raised in the likeness of Christ. Just as we are perfectly known, then we will perfectly know it hasn't happened yet. And it's from the Bible that we come to the conclusion, not a doctrine of demons, right? This is what the Bible teaches, and we would do well to recognize that. In part two, we're going to look at of the question, does a Christian have a sin nature? We're going to look at Romans chapter 7, and we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5 and see the war that the Holy Spirit is engaged in against our sin nature and um, kind of consider some implications of that.